God is good. Okay, Mark chapter 10. Praise the Lord. Jesus was having a discussion actually with a crowd of people and it ended up being a discussion with his disciples as well. I'm going to kind of pick up in the middle of it. Verse 23, Jesus looked round about and said to his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Now that's following on the heels of a conversation that Jesus had with a uh, young man that came to him. Uh, and the young man made uh, some statements like he started out talking to Jesus. How may I inherit eternal life? Okay. And uh, then Jesus worked with him for a minute. Talked to him about the Ten Commandments. Uh, Praise the Lord. And then Jesus looked at him. It says in verse uh, 21, and loved him and said to him, one thing that you lack, because you see, you, you have to understand, the young man would not have come to Jesus and talked as though he did not possess something if he had it. So the thing he was missing was a connection for his faith with eternal life, because he knew that's what Jesus was all about. Are you out there today? Okay, so it's a very practical, right down the middle of the road kind of a question for Jesus. And so he answered him, uh, it's a shocking answer for most people. Uh, Jesus said, one thing that you lack, the thing that you're lacking, in other words, go your way, sell whatever you have, give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven and come, take up your cross and follow me. Now, his, Jesus' disciples were standing right there with him, and they were completely and totally shocked by what Jesus told that person. How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, because the young man walked away grieved. So, so he was a person that had great possession, but one thing he was lacking was he was lacking a connection with eternal life, his faith. He was unable to receive from God because his money was an obstruction. His personal possessions were an obstruction to his spiritual life. You say, well, well can you tell me a little bit? Jesus is going to explain it uh, to us. But, you know, what it, what it really comes down to is if you can't act towards God in a certain way concerned about what's going to happen with your money, then what will happen with you is you will drift further and further away from God. So, you know, as it turns out, Jesus wasn't really uh, trying to take anything away from the guy. What he was trying to do was get him on a different track because what was, what was really happening is the value system that the young man had was going to have to shift. And the reason why he could make no connection with spiritual things is because his value system was wrong. So he was going to have to make a personal change. Now, so uh, this is the third message of this series. We started out talking about sowing seed, financial seed, and, and sowing, uh, if you remember, uh, Isaac sowed in famine. He sowed seed and it was little. Now over here, we've got the seed has grown up. And uh, Jesus talked about 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold harvest. Praise the Lord, that's big, and it started out little. Boy, there's a difference. Hallelujah. Now, th this is what the young, rich young ruler he's called in other passages. This is the part that he was missing. You see, he couldn't make the connection between the processes of God. See, God is the one who created you with a stomach that has, has to be fed. He, he, he's the one, I mean, he's the one that created the place. He knows you need a roof over your head. He knows you need clothes on your back. And because of the way he made us, 
to enter into his glory, okay, not just any old clothes will do. I mean, you want to wear something that fits and that looks nice, covers you up, but also, I mean, you have some particular tastes about your car, come on now, your house, and you won't just eat just anything. I know you don't eat just anything, do you? Don't you select what you eat? Well, God made you that way. You wouldn't have taste buds, which would create a palate of interest. You wouldn't be able to smell anything if it didn't matter. So God created you. So he's not like an obstructionist the way some people have framed him. All of this is his idea. For you and I to have a life, to be able to function and participate with him. See, the the poverty thing is the devil's idea. And then, of course, the devil being a liar blames the whole thing on God. And people that don't know better listen to the devil talking to them about God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that was this, this young man, that was where he was disconnected. You know, he was unable to make a connection. That's the reason why he came to Jesus talking like that. He said, how can I inherit eternal life? Now, he was already rich. He was already Jewish. He already had a covenant with God. And so after Jesus went through that with him, uh, and, and you're still lacking something, aren't you? Because Jesus knew what the young man was going to have to do was he was going to have to disconnect from the money trust to hook up with the God trust. Now his disciples, Jesus' disciples are standing there listening to the whole thing. Who are you there? And uh, his disciples were astonished, verse 24, at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto, the, uh, unto them, he wanted to make sure they got it, Children, to his grown men disciples, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Now, later on in the New Testament, it explains why. Jesus explained why. You can't have two masters. You can't love money, trust money, and trust God. You're going to have to let go. So what Jesus was proposing to that young man is that he was going to have to trust first. He was going to have to believe first. You know, a lot of times people want to see and then believe. So this young man was going to have to uh, trust, believe, and walk away from what he was obstructed by. He was going to have to let this thing go He was going to have to let go of his identity. He was going to have to let go of probably inheritances, family connections, all of the things that went along with the big money. Come on now. And he was going to give to the poor. And then he was going to follow Jesus becoming in a way a no name. Because he was going to have to forsake his name. Now, now, he would be one of Jesus' disciples, but you know, they weren't well thought of in most circles anyway. Come on and say amen. Are you out there today? Glory to God. So, uh, verse 25, Jesus said, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, in, uh, they all knew what an eye of a needle was. Uh, because in Jerusalem, in the wall of Jerusalem, the gates, they have the gates where you get in. Okay, well, at night, they close the gates, and they secure the place with the eye of a needle, which is a little door in the gate that's easier to guard, and the only people that can come and go are the people that the guard lets through. Now, it happens to be so narrow that a person has to step through without a big thing on their back. This was security 
2,000 years ago. Come on now, it was a metal detector, come on. <laughs> like at, at the airport. So they're, they're, they're stepping through to get into the city, okay, and everybody knew you're not going to get a camel through that thing, especially with a burden on his back. You're not going to get a donkey, you're not going to even get a person with a backpack through that thing. And it's designed that way. It's easier, Jesus said, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, which is another way of saying most people find themselves unwilling to let go of the thing that they're holding on to and trusting in in order to get up and follow Jesus without reservation. Okay. Now, that, that's, that's a really strong statement. And his disciples said, wow, you know, uh, they were astonished. Verse 26, uh, they said they were astonished out of measure, saying well, among themselves, well, then who can they be, be saved? Jesus, this is really going to limit things. Now, it's another way of saying they understood human nature. They saw the young man walk away, and they were not surprised. Because most people have a sense about what's going to work and what's not going to work. So Jesus' disciples are thinking, okay, well, there, there'll be, you know, 10 or 12 of us that make it. Well, all the rest are, are not going to make it. Amen. Are you out there? Amen. Okay, so Jesus said, okay, okay, uh, here, here's, here's what I'm going to do for you. Jesus looked upon them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. So, in other words, God is able to change people so that they will voluntarily and willingly let go of the thing that they're trusting in that's keeping them from, you know, so it's a value system. Which, which thing do you trust in? To make the shift over to trusting to God involves, it's a heart thing. It doesn't have, actually have anything to do with the money. It's a heart thing. So Jesus knew exactly where this young man was and he knew what the problem was going to be. His heart was not yet ready to do what Peter and the other disciples had done, which they, they brought up, verse 28, Peter said, well, look, uh, it, Peter began to say, well, well, we've left everything to follow you. And of course, Jesus knew that. All right, now remember, letting go of the money for the young man and giving it to the poor was what Jesus said to him. Okay, but he didn't stick around long enough for the promise. Are you there? The promise is the seed that you sow is much smaller. We're talking about financial, in financial terms. So what he would have given away would have been much less than what it would have become. Now, so if money is, is, is important, but you see when your heart changes, and your value system shifts, you don't care about the money. And that's exactly the point. Disconnect from the money. Ooh, are you there? Verily, verily, I, here's the promise. Verily, verily, I say unto you, there is no man that has left house, brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, or lands for my sake and the gospels, which was what he proposed to the young man. But it's also the very thing that Peter did. See, Peter was the one just last week. He's the one that had the boat. And Jesus filled the boat up. Okay, but Peter walked away from the boat and his family and his, you know, uh, his, his uh, people that were depending upon him. Praise the Lord. Now, later in the New Testament, <laughs> the Apostle Paul is the one who's pointing out that Peter has this big entourage 
a family following him everywhere he goes. And, it's, and it taint cheap. So when Peter left his boat, he did exactly what Jesus said. And that was the end of him ever having to deal with his money himself. Money is never even mentioned in Peter's life after that. Amen. So you, you can stay connected to money. Have a relationship with it. Ooh, count it every night. You know those old stories, nursery rhymes? Come on now. Hallelujah. You, you can do that. Or you can let it all go and be delivered from even having to deal with it. And go over here and connect with the kingdom so then you're connecting to spiritual things. You're walking with the living God who created all these things and he makes sure, just like with Peter, he makes sure that you end up with enough. And if 30-fold won't do it, then we'll go 60. If that won't do it, then we'll go 100. That's the next verse. Glory to God. Are you still out there? So the point being is God is not asking us to give up anything. What he's asking us to do is to accept his way. God is not going to put himself subject to his own creation. Money, God, you, you, can, you can go ahead and strike it up. God will never get himself in a situation where money controls him. Zero. Never. He's the creator. Woo, thank you, Lord Jesus. Go ahead and say, I'm going to team up with him. Our heavenly, are you out there today? Your, your heavenly father. Okay, now, so, uh, the promise again, there is no man that has left house or brother or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. This is what would have happened with the young man. It's initially what happened with Peter and the rest of the disciples, but then verse 30 happened. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. So when Peter walked away from his boat, little did he know that he was going to become the person that he is today. Everybody still talks about Peter. Peter is one of the most famous, if it matters, people that has ever walked on earth. Billions of people. And you know what? If he had held on to the net, oh yeah, his, his, his sons would have known him. Maybe his son's sons would have known him. And they might have spoken well about him on, at Father's Day. <laughs> Who knows? But do you see the difference? A hundredfold. Peter is now living. See, see, he's not dead. Peter is with Jesus and he is flourishing in his 100-fold return. He shall receive a hundredfold in this time, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands, with persecutions, because it makes people mad, and in the world to come, eternal life. See, so, in other words, this is the answer to the young man's question. It's all still the same conversation. This is the answer. He just didn't stick around long enough for the promise. That happens to a lot of people. I'm not going to put my money in that place. You hear it at work all the time. Oh, go ahead and say amen. amen. Therefore, the struggle goes on. Glory to God. 
Okay, so I want to ask you to turn with me, if you would, over to 2 Corinthians. There's a reason why you can shout. Just one verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Hallelujah. Now, so that's what happened to Peter. Peter is now rich. He followed Jesus. Come on now, are you out there? When you accept what this is talking about, this is what's called a substitutionary sacrifice. So Jesus took our poverty at Calvary to give us his position of rich. Okay? So he's the word made flesh. We're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, members of his body. We're seated with him in heavenly places. You're, you can't get any higher. You can't have any more. There isn't any more. If there's not enough, God just makes more. So, but, but when you let go of money, it doesn't even matter to you. It doesn't own you. But you end up wearing the best, driving the best, whatever you want. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus did say the way this works, first the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. Then comes the harvest. See, so, um, you know, Peter, later in, in his life, I'm sure that, that he experienced some transition issues. But once he reached a certain spot, he was testified of by the other spiritual leaders that Peter doesn't have financial problems. He's got his family following him around everywhere he goes. You know, who, who knows how many people and he, all the hotel bills are paid. You know, they're not, they're not chasing him after he leaves town. He, you know, he's collecting the points but giving them to other people. Oh, come on and say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so you, you made rich. Uh, hallelujah. God has delivered us from the power of poverty by what Jesus did for us at Calvary. Okay, now next verse just right in my Bible is right on the next page. Chapter 9, verse 10 says, Now he that ministers seed to the sower... Both minister bread for your food. So everybody's got seed. If, if you're eating, you have seed. Remember what Isaac did was he took their dinner and he sowed it. Okay? And it became a hundredfold. Same thing. You see, this is the testimony of the way God works. Old covenant, new covenant. It's the same. Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. He gives seed to the sower, bread to the eater. There's your food while you're on the way. While it's growing, he takes care of you. And then all of a sudden, boom, things start changing. God is able to make all great. Grace. All right, so let me finish this verse. He that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So there's the young man's answer. See, Jesus talked about you use money as a tool to make friends with people for the kingdom. So you use money as a tool to get the gospel out. It increases the fruits of your righteousness. So it's both a spiritual return and it is a natural return. It's twofold. Glory to God. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet if you would please. Praise God. The Lord is good. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I came to church today. Hallelujah. Promises of God are true. Hallelujah. Which is the reason why you can trust Jesus with your life. 
Now, there are alternatives. You know, people make choices. Sometimes they make the wrong choice. But if you make the right choice, which is choosing Jesus as your Savior. Hallelujah. You, you might have a, just a whole bunch of stuff going on in your life, and maybe a lot of it is not nice. But you can rest assured that if you accept Jesus as your Savior, see, first of all, He's going to take care of you spiritually. Then He's going to start working in your life just like He always does. And He'll start fixing things that you can't fix. You know, the things that you've been working on for so long and they just don't seem to work. Relationships, money, jobs, career, all of it put together is called life. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So instead of you trying to fix your life, turn your life over to him and he will fix it. Thank you, Jesus. So every person that is born into this earth is born of Adam. The Bible explains this. But then Jesus talked about a second birth. He called it being born again. Now, you know, people question, what about being born again? Yeah, it's, it's both a natural birth and then it's a spiritual birth. Also can mean born from above. So if you've never been born from above, everybody that's in this room obviously has been born naturally or you wouldn't be here, okay? But if you have not been born again spiritually, you can be today. Amen. We'll, we'll pray with you right now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to get yourself better. You don't have to get ready. You couldn't do it if you wanted to. All you have to do is say, yes, I'll accept the new birth. Praise the Lord. So if I'm talking to you, you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You know, you might have been going to church all your life. That's not the same thing. Being born again is a second birth. If you would like to be born again, just raise your hand like this. Anywhere in the room, any person. Praise the name of Jesus. God is good. Praise you. I'm looking around. See, sometimes I miss people's hands. So you could just raise it and hold it up. Hallelujah. God is good. Well, happy Mother's Day. Praise the name of Jesus. It looks like everybody's saved. <clears throat> so if you would, uh, just say this with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to have a personal relationship with you and our Heavenly Father. Father, I call you my source. I look to you and praise you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen.